Hello and welcome to the first ever Create and Activate podcast. I'm Adam Britton, Managing Director of Trunk BBI. I'm joined by my co-host, John Butler, our CEO at Trunk BBI. John, it's very exciting because this is something that we've been wanting to do for a really long time. And obviously Create and Activate is something that we're incredibly passionate about. Do you want to just give the audience a little bit of insight as to who you are and also what Create and Activate is? Yeah, cheers, Adam. Um, I'm CEO of Trunk BBI. My journey kind of started out when I was 14 and I got an LC2 computer in my bedroom. And uh, my dad was a magic marker man back in the day before computers and my mum was a typographer. So I'd always really had creativity in me. I went from there to university, uh, it was a really interesting journey. And then I decided to start working in agencies, which was a natural progression. I then started to work for a Fast Track 100 business, really exciting, and it was reverse e-commerce. And that's where I really got exposed to performance marketing back in the early days of 2004, 2005. And I've worked there for about five to six years, slaved away almost, you know, that's a, a life sentence almost, and then decided to go and set up on my own and set up my own agency and very quickly started realizing that creative and activation go hand in hand and you know it's really important you get some agencies that are really good at creative and then you get some agencies that really get performance but having the two that are married together is like something really special that I feel really passionate about and I think marketeers can really gain from. So Adam yeah it'd be great for you just to uh, give us a rundown of yourself and your your past as well. Yeah sure so I joined what was Big Brand Ideas seven and a half years ago I think there was six of us in a little terrace house in Macclesfield and you know, I've seen significant growth in the agency o- over that time. And before that, I was kind of more focused towards gamification and, and creative technology, but always had a passion for content, social content, whether that's film, animation, or even um, gamification, obviously, as well, with my with my past in kind of in that sector. Um, during the time of being at BBI, what I've kind of found is that obviously when, when I first joined, we were a a web dev agency who did branding and, and SEO. But as we started to develop the trunk offering out when we opened up in November 2016, we kind of landed on it at the perfect time because that was when everyone needs content, everyone wants to get you know have video content out there. But probably the first two years of our kind of existence is we were creating incredible videos, but no one was seeing them really. You know, it was a we, we definitely certainly had certain campaigns that went viral, we had certain campaigns that were um you know, really well received and got results, but actually it was mu- it was al- always pinning on organic because I think at the time we didn't even have a paid offering ourselves, a paid social offering. Whereas actually it's all around, as you rightly say, creating the content and then having someone to activate it. And those two kind of um, people or two departments all sitting in one room, all underpinned by strategy and actually finding out what that research is and how your audience is going to move first is something that I'm incredibly passionate about. And I think us as an agency is incredibly passionate about. And that's why we're doing this podcast. Um, It's going to be a fortnightly podcast where we'll be kind of doing a deep dive mini series into different sectors such as sports sponsorship, healthcare, financial services. We'll be inviting on industry experts from these different sectors to talk to us about their opinion on how to create, how to activate, and what the marketing landscape looks like going forward. Today's episode, and to kick off the first mini-series, is all around sports sponsorship. We'll soon be introducing Isaac Kirk, our digital strategist, um, into the studio. And it's something that, you know, sports sponsorship is something we've been very passionate about, certainly since kind of Trunk got formed sort of five and a half, six years ago. It's something that we've massively worked in and um, from most Premier League clubs to the NFL to um, a lot of tennis tournaments all over the world. And it's a sector that that probably needs a little bit of improvement and it's something that we'll be discussing over the next four episodes. Um, but before we go any further, shall we invite Isaac into the studio? Sounds great. Hello. Pleasure, pleasure to be selected for the first podcast it's uh it's an honor what can i say um yeah sports 
What do you want, what do you want to know? <laughs> the whole playbook, mate. The whole playbook. Everything. Tell us everything, man. Tell us everything. You've yeah. definitely come on brand today, Isaac, <laughs> yeah. with your uh, 732 sponsors all well, over that jacket. Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, not not a lot of them are household names. Cheese nips. <laughs> Cheese nips and nut butter aren't necessarily uh, flying off the shelves at Asda. But... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But no, um, yeah. I, I, couldn't, I, I looked in the wardrobe this morning. I couldn't resist. It's quite interesting, isn't it? But sports sponsorship, I suppose, for me, was always something that executives used to pretty much go away and do some sponsorship because they've supported a certain team but I know that things have got a lot more sophisticated now it'd be great to hear your take on what modern sports sponsorship 100%. is. It's probably worth mentioning for context that I am obviously a strategist at Trunk BBI um, and what that essentially means is that I get to do a lot of the the fun big thinking stuff so I get to take a step back and, and figure out how Create and Activate work together so not just one side or the other um, and what that means is that for the past sort of three or four weeks, I've sort of been deep diving into sports marketing. So that's you know an aid of, of of putting together and thinking about you know how how does it look nowadays? You know what what's changed? And, and you mentioned John that it did used to be the executive, you know Aston Villa fan. You know maybe he's a managing director of a marketing agency or something, <laughs> and uh, he's slapping his logo. He's getting his digs in already. <laughs> He's been here yeah. for one minute. He's, uh, <laughs> he's chucking the Legos on the, uh, you know, on the billboard, the executive areas, and and that's it's all very well and good. But in reality, the the role of sports marketing is so much bigger now. Like it, creating activate is almost the perfect name to to talk about why sports marketing is developed because it used to just be a brand awareness channel. It used to be just a we'll get our name on something, and you know maybe that'll be something that that people assimilate with or that they associate with, and. Those fundamentals still exist, but now sports marketing is 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 essentially the linchpin for wider campaigns. It is the it's the centre point that you can essentially play off, mm-hmm. and that's where the activation arm comes in, and that's where the understanding you know with sort of more modern uh, analytics profiles and better understanding of what these things are doing. You know, back in the day when United have got sharp on the front of the kit, there probably wasn't a great deal of thought that went into how is that going to sell more tellies apart mm-hmm. from people just going to see the name. Mm-hmm. Whereas nowadays there are there's sales and ROI objectives attached to sponsorships, and these are tangible now. People can actually figure out how much of an impact it's having, and that's that largely owes itself to to digital and just activations outside of just slapping a sponsor on a shirt because those days are gone, mm-hmm. really. Um, and there's examples of it everywhere. You can see them. You know, there's really effective sponsorships that you you know that you instantly think that brand and that. Thing. I think Budweiser and the World Cup's an example. They've sponsored that for 40 years. That is the, you think of a World Cup match, it's, it's Budweiser is on the hoardings. It's, you know, certain things like that, PlayStation, the Champions League, they are synonymous at this point. Mm-hmm. And that's partly longevity, but it's partly just the way they've activated and the fact that they use those sponsorships and the fact that they tie them in with, with things that, that means that they don't just put a logo on a board. Mm-hmm. They associate with it. It becomes part of their brand. So... Yeah, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. And the more you go into it, the more, you know, it's like Pandora's box, the more you sort of uh, you unravel. So there's obviously the, the really top level obvious ones, you know, the World Cups, you know, Super Bowls. Um, but I think a lot of the a lot of the interesting stuff and a lot of the minutiae is in, in the, the smaller, smarter campaigns. So hopefully we'll get a chance to talk through some of those, you know, we'll dig some of those out as we sort of carry on in the podcast. But But yeah. The, it's it's fascinating. It really is a it really is a change in industry, and it's it's only getting more important really for marketers as it gets better understood. So yeah, there are, there are sort of endless channels vying for marketing budget. Yeah, why why sports sponsorship? Why would somebody go? Actually, I'm going to move budget from there into sports sponsorship. You've kind of answered it in your in in, in your intro there around um, it's a linchpin. You know, it's, yeah. it, it also gives you that sort of platform, doesn't it, to allow you to then take it into other areas. Yeah. Um, but why else? Well, I think for me, to think about sports sponsorship as a channel that ends there. So the investment would be, you know, we're just going to invest in sp- sponsoring a team and leaving it there. That That's poor. That's not mm-hmm. that's not. It's still, it's still happening as well. Of course, you know, of it's course. Massively it's massively still loads happening. Of examples. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. But when it becomes good and when it becomes different and when it starts justifying its role in the marketing mix is when when you have it as a centre point for a campaign. Mm-hmm. So 
you can tie in with with it. You've got you know whether it's experiences or whether it's sort of digital campaigns that use the likeness or whether it's offering things to the fans that you're ultimately trying to appeal to. Those are the things where it, it really changes from being just you know just like I said the logo on the shirt to mm. something that's that's far more tangible. And what that does basically is associate. It's it's by association. So brands are always trying to associate with something, whether it's a jingle or a color or whatever else whatever else it is. By sponsoring sports and integrating with sports properly, you're trying to associate the experience. Mm-hmm. So that's that gets to the core of, of of what it is people are trying to trying to associate with. You know, when when a brand sponsors a Manchester United or a, a Manchester City or a Liverpool or a top tier club, they want to associate with victory and success and the emotion that goes with it and those sound bites and those moments and that's what they want to be associated with because it ultimately elevates their position as well. That's interesting. You talked about the. Uh, the motivation side of it there, but what about the emotional factors too that brands can associate with and what role do I think brands play in actually promoting promoting well being and being being at the cutting edge of I think I mean bringing change to people. We're obviously doing a sponsorship on sports marketing. I think we've got, you know, it's probably we've got forty minutes an hour. Realistically, that's only enough to scratch the surface. This mm-hmm. is a this is a topic that's so dense that there's so much to cover. Mm-hmm. Um, because there's so many different ways that you can activate and be successful. Mm-hmm. The fundamentals are the same. They need to be underpinned by solid fundamentals, like I said. You know, you can't just expect to do the bare minimum and uh, be successful. Mm-hmm. But the association, like you've mentioned, John, uh, is 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 what you want to sort of sort of pick out. So there is that emotional side to it. There is an emotional side to you know to sponsoring certain athletes or certain uh, or aligning with certain athletes' points of view. So there's obviously a famous example in the States where Colin Kaepernick was quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers, was famously taking a knee during the national anthem um, a couple of years ago and got dropped for it. But instead of disassociating with him, his personal sponsor, Nike, doubled down because it was a, <laughs> it was a cause that they yeah. stood up for. So mm-hmm. by not taking the party line there, by being more emotional and by aligning themselves with that they've aligned their brand with that cause as well and it, mm-hmm. and it takes it, it elevates it from just being that's a man that wears the the nike swoosh to that is a man that stands for something and we mm-hmm. stand alongside him mm-hmm. you see it with um like even the irony of f1 drivers being climate activists and, and such like sebastian vettel at the moment is you know i think he's on question time um the yeah, it, it's fascinating that that again, that's a cause. He's very outspoken. He's very vocal. And I think in, in the past, the the desire for marketers was that you would be very clean and proper. You would do a readout. You'd do mm-hmm. X and Y. Now it's about aligning and selecting athletes and brands and and teams and whatever else it is that aligns with your brand values. Mm-hmm. And making sure that you know instead of being a, he said something that could be controversial or could be whatever that you align with it and, and you double down on it where where fit of course yeah um but yeah it, it's really interesting that there's such an emotional side to it now that you know these athletes and these teams have, we've got better access to them than ever they now are personalities yeah i think fans want it as well don't they you know i think fans see right through sponsors who just go in sponsor a club whack a as you say, yeah. whack a logo on a shirt and just go, yeah, we're, we're your sponsor now, but we're not actually going to do anything for the fans. Yeah. We're not going to align to the club's values. We're not going to create any content that explains why we're doing this sponsorship. Mm-hmm. We're just going to put this here because what typically happens here is it's usually um, a gambling company who are bra- who are based abroad as well yeah. because they're not even after the UK market. They're after a, um, a market that's based in a different country altogether. Um, so what typically happens is they'll come in whack that whack that there and the fans don't even hear from that sponsor again until the end of the sponsorship when the pr comes through that their sponsorship's ended and they're like oh they almost became wallpaper on that shirt we forgot that they even existed i think that's really pertinent because the wallpaper example worked perfectly because especially with football sports shirts sponsors like you think the 20 premier league clubs you're going to see that shirt mm-hmm. you know if you're, if you're a football fan if you watch premier league you're going to see every single shirt in the Premier League multiple times a season. I couldn't tell you which of the ten betting companies, sponsors, yeah. uh, whoever, you know, yeah. I couldn't even necessarily name them mm-hmm. off the top of my head because they do just blend in. Mm-hmm. So it does become about differentiation. It becomes about why are you sponsoring? You know, mm-hmm. it's not just a thirty-second ad spot with mm-hmm. I don't know, with a Wolves player in in a casino or whatever it may be. Yeah. It's about taking it further. Now, in football, 
football on a on a club level can be very can be poor in terms of how they activate. And I think oftentimes it's because it's almost shoehorned in. I think Chevrolet and United, a mm-hmm. famous example where I think the guy that signed the deal got fired because really? it cost a fortune. It was seventy five mm-hmm. million pounds a season, not sixty million pounds a season, don't quote me. Um on that one. But I think ultimately when they try to justify and vindicate the decision to GM, it couldn't be done and yeah. there was no clear association between Chevrolet and, and Manchester United the American yeah, car Chevrolet company from good, Detroit they? Yeah, Chevrolet yeah. good and United <laughs> aren't <laughs> it's, really, it's really interesting that when you talk about creating content or just purely just trying to do the old fashioned content which is billboards and front of shirt kind of sponsorship how can brands actually activate and make the most out of that sponsorship opportunity I think that that's a bit of a moving target honestly because it consumer behaviour changes all the time so back in the day it probably was a let's get Kevin Keegan in a bath store advert or you know and you know walking up the street and talking about uh, whatever it was but but nowadays consumers are so exposed to Mm -hmm. so much marketing all the time that if you do the cookie cutter stuff if you do just the you know if you do just the it's the adverts yeah I think the the easiest way to sum it up is it's when you create an advert with with talent or with a footballer it's going to look like an advert yeah. and people don't go on social media to watch adverts they yeah. want to watch something that's engaging exactly the only notable adverts i can think of from footballers are ones where the acting is terrible like yeah. there's the they... famous united one with the Cassiero del diablo wine company and yeah. wayne rooney's doing the they say he's a legend yeah. um bit and, and it's so wooden and it's so terrible that it's almost served its purpose yeah, yeah. but it's it, almost like a parody. yeah yeah but it's, yeah. it certainly wasn't designed to it was no. just that they were asking you know uh, someone that hadn't thought about it just thought, all right, we've got access to the United First team, we'll do an advert. Yeah. And and Pe- people using footballers as actors is their first mistake. Yeah, it's, exactly. They're not, they're not actors. Exactly, like. exactly. I think that um, it's a weird one, so when I say it's changed, Crystal Palace now are, are really good on social media, really good on TikTok. So they do like, they were doing stuff last year where whatever trend or whatever, whatever went viral in terms of, you know, Moving in in TikTok, or whatever. So, do you remember the, the the wheels and doors debate? No. The, are there more wheels on earth or doors? Oh, of course, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I've still not got an answer to that. <laughs> what what is it? I'm team door, hundred percent. Door, I, I, I can't. It's just doors everywhere, isn't there? I know, but there's wheels on your chair on your chair here. There's there's eight wheels on your chair. It's true, but there's only know, one door in this room. Yeah, the earth's a big place, though. How many office chairs <laughs> are? There? Do you know what I mean? What do you reckon? More wheels or more doors? <laughs> Definitely uh, more doors. More doors. <laughs> you know. Lego alone. <laughs> Think about a Lego Not pack. every chair has wheels on it. Yeah, but no. Honestly, I'm, there's no doors on a chair. This will turn into the Wheels and Doors <laughs> podcast if we're not careful, there, boys. So, Sorry, go <laughs> um, That trend came out instantly before I'd even necessarily seen that it blown up on Twitter. Mm-hmm. I saw some content from Crystal Palace, the football club, that were asking players at training this question. Right, and, yeah. and it was it was really, you know, it was engaging. It was the mm. fact that their athletes just. They're not being wooden, or they're not, yeah. ask, you know, selling a product. But they're wearing sponsored kit. Mm-hmm. They are, you know, they're on the training ground with logos behind them and stuff, and they're, they're answering these questions. And it's that organic exposure that again brings it through to a more modern audience, whereby that's excellent exposure for their for their sponsors and for mm-hmm. their brands without it being terribly wooden and without yeah, it being Liv- terribly. Liverpool do it really well with with their sponsors, don't they? Yeah. And I don't know whether that is because. Um, they've obviously got the, the TV channel behind them and I don't know whether it's the creatives within the club that are advising the sponsors because it all seems to be really good it's not as if just one sponsor like Nivea is doing it well yeah. or Axe is doing it well it's all of them, even the smaller brands that you might not have heard of, I think there was like a coconut milk or coconut water <laughs> yeah. that did that amazing spoof almost like The Office sort of mm-hmm. little mini mockumentary yeah. and it's just incredible and that is the kind of content that you want to watch. And I'm not even a Liverpool fan, but I watch that as a yeah, as yeah. an Aston Villa fan. I still watch it because it's great content. Um, and then you get the flip side of it and you look at some of Arsenal's content where they're just grabbing a, let's say it was a coconut water, saying, come and buy this coke. Yeah. I drink this coconut water. Stop <laughs> yeah. lying. No, you don't. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So, uh, yeah. Uh, like I said, I mean, there's absolutely, there's, there's such a wide gamut of it. Because there's so mm-hmm. much advertising, there's so much marketing, especially when people have got sports and, and teams and stuff at their... At their at their behest mm-hmm. so yeah it's uh, it's really interesting I think Liverpool like you said do do it really well I mean I think something that recurs they don't tend to give the players speaking roles in mm-hmm. those adverts and if yeah. you think like all the Nivea ones it's all like there's a backing track and there's some sort of spoof happening yeah. or you know some, some gaffes mm. but you know they don't they're not asking James Milner to, to deliver 
28 lines of dialogue yeah, to camera. Exactly, yeah, exactly, yeah. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's, just, it's just about being smart and just about thinking about it, essentially, because... But with the Nivea stuff as well, they use the emotional hook, so they involve the fans a lot, yeah. and they bring the fans into it, and it's not they don't even mention a product. No. You know, they just talk about the fan experience, what they have what they want to do. Sometimes these, these pieces of content are 15, 20 minutes long mm -hmm. as well. Um, they're not just sticking to social guidelines of seven seconds long and no sound and no yeah. logo. It's actually a long form content that people can really be involved in. And, and it, because it was, cause it's got a narr sorry, it's cause it's got a narrative, it allows people to get emotionally hooked onto it as well. So they can watch the full episode and look forward to the next one because it's actually serving a purpose rather than it just being an advert. Um, in terms of trends in the world of sports marketing at the moment, what's cutting through and what's sort of falling flat? I think, I mean, as I mentioned before, sports marketing is so big that to say that there's one trend would be wrong, but there's obviously some pretty big things that have happened over over the past couple of years. <laughs> um, so what that meant, you know, from a rational point of view, that digitization of sports sponsorship and sports marketing has gone, has gone you know, accelerated so much compared to where it was mm -hmm. and that's obviously a, a result of people not being able to go to the grounds where mm -hmm. you know but basically an industry built on the attending fan the mm -hmm. person in the stadium at the racetrack whatever it may be and obviously there's perks that come with that so beer at premier league football grounds as an example you know if you can't get if, if heineken are a sponsor team you're drinking heineken at the ground and that's that mm -hmm. and that's an exposure element that people get you know, or that Hannah can get from that sponsorship, that all disappeared. So suddenly the 75,000 people that were in Old Trafford every other week that were getting exposed to the brand directly and, and consuming the brand, that just disappeared. Mm -hmm. So it became a case of, right, how do we now make the most of our sponsorship and not just be the name on the billboard or the name on the outside? And and what that was is that, that digital's obviously taken over massively. Um, and, and there's things like gamification, NFTs, um, NFT is obviously becoming mainstream during that sort of time and, and the crypto space has led to an absolute boom in, in sponsorships and, and crypto sponsors for uh, across all sports. I think it's up 1100% last year. Mm. Um, and what they're doing I think, is I think most football clubs have, have their own crypto as well, don't I think they? so, yeah. They've I all mean, just fallen flat on the face there. I know, I know. <laughs> they is, did all fall over at the yeah, same time. All at the same time. The World Cup has now got an official crypto partner as well, really? I believe. Yeah. Um, so it is, yeah, it's gone absolutely, it's, it's seemingly come out of nowhere, but mm -hmm. it's now very much in the mainstream. Mm -hmm. But that's because, and the reason that that's happening is because of that crossover with digital. So because of the exposure to digital and the exposure to these things, there's now more of a desired, sports might not have been the relevant place for that sponsorship mm -hmm. to happen um, sort of two years ago, mm -hmm. because, you know, the, you're, not talking to the right audience. The fact that you know people were participating in esports and were just online all the time, and there was the news cycles around Bitcoin on its bull run during mm -hmm. uh, during the pandemic and, and things like that, it got so many people into it that now it's just commonplace within sports. There's the the relationship's been established, and now it's been taken advantage of by those crypto companies because it's not just a asinine sponsorship anymore there's a link between the clubs and that's being created with you know, nfts and fan tokens and, and, and those sort of things where that sponsorship isn't just a name because actually you can collect you know unique trading cards or whatever else it may be or or even like i think the the technology is going towards ticketing and stuff like that these things are now t you know they have pretty direct ties to the clubs and and leagues and and um, tournaments that they're sponsoring so it's becoming far more tangible and, and those sponsorships are again aren't just necessarily names on the board but but are becoming you know there's there's outputs for it there's there's clear links to them and by tying themselves to that they are not just making themselves legitimate um or legitimize themselves but they're also um they're also trying to provide for the fans mm. um i think we we went to the british grand prix recently didn't we and the only sponsor I remember from there was Crypto.com. Yeah. yeah, it was everywhere. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was absolutely everywhere. And I think they they're taking advantage of the documentary that was on Netflix and, yep. and a whole new wave of audience coming into the sport, and they're directly targeting the re what they call the retail customer for crypto. Mm -hmm. um, we can go into crypto. <laughs> Let's not go into crypto. Let's, that, that's. I, I, I think yeah. it's really interesting though. This point, isn't it? That actually, sponsorships gone from being at that event to always on. 
and all these new ways of and techniques of doing it and these multi-channel approaches and multi-asset approaches allow people to do that and make the most out of that sponsorship 100 mm-hmm. percent. i think there's, there's just far more of an understanding from the companies that are getting involved in sponsorship as to what that means for them so as I said, back in the day, you know, you'd, you'd look around a Premier League stadium, or you know, it might be in Highbury even. There would be almost local firms that you'd see on the yeah. hoardings, and, yeah. and nowadays that wouldn't happen There's, because you get companies that don't even sell products in the UK, mm. or don't have a big presence in the UK mm-hmm. that will sponsor, um, you know, sponsor football clubs or sponsor the league because of the reach of that, and because of the fact that they can associate with that product. So it's far more of a draw than, than what previously was the, the billboard and the stand, the name on the shirt that doesn't yeah. have any link. It's more important to them that there is a, a tie and there's a, something that they can take advantage of from either an emotional or a product or an integration point of view than it is to have you know the fan in the stadium go and buy it. What's interesting with it as well is those bigger companies they associate themselves to the, let's call it the top six, top seven, for such a longer period than those of the other 14 teams in the Premier League. Apart from, I know Norwich are no longer in the Premier League. They've, they've had Lotus for, for quite, for quite yeah. some time. And I think before that it was like uh, Norwich Union or whatever. And Proton for a bit. Was it Pro- yeah. Pro- uh, uh, Proton? Proton, they're the same. Proton and Lotus. I think they might be. I think they're yeah. like yeah. away, in, away and home. Too. But if you think about your United, your Liverpools, Tottenham's, they associate those front of shirt sponsors are there for such a long time. They sign five, ten year deals, whereas yeah. your mid table clubs probably swap every two years. Why do you think that is? Why do you think the are they not getting as much exposure? So they kind of test it and then they don't activate it in the right way. So they have to just dip out because they go like, oh, this isn't working. So we'll try something else. I think that's relatively nail on the head. I think that obviously the longevity of the other sponsors comes from typically the success and, and, and the association by it. But that's because it's almost the old school way of sports marketing where success and visibility is your only metric. It's the only thing you're relying on. Mm-hmm. Smaller sponsors have the same opportunity. You say smaller sponsors, you know, when you're talking about whether it's a, a Norwich or a Nottingham Forest, you know, these are still clubs that are going to get millions and millions yeah. of eyeballs. Oh, yeah. it's, a, it's about the activation on those levels, absolutely. And, and the... I suppose the longevity element for for the for the traditional top six and, and the brands that you come to mind, so JVC for Arsenal mm-hmm. or Vodafone for United, or mm-hmm. you can rattle them off for, for well until you run out of <laughs> until you run out of sponsors. <laughs> yeah, but those those essentially were successes because of the club success, and that's obviously what sponsors want. But I suppose the point is that it's moved on now that you don't even necessarily have to be massively successful for the campaigns to work. I think Paddy Power. Obviously, they they hit and miss. But the sponsorship campaign they did a couple of years ago for the teams in the lower leagues, mm-hmm. where they shirt sponsored about eight clubs, I think, and then took sponsors off, yeah. like so that there was clean shirt. Now, yeah. from a traditional sponsorship point of view, like if we're thinking about the old school mm-hmm. way, that makes no sense at all because that's the only thing that you're buying. Like you know, without the without the principles behind it, that's what you're. That's the real estate you're buying. In the new school, they activated that on social they activated that outside of it and that got a much bigger reach than if they just put yeah, the Paddy Power stunt, logo it? Yeah, it's it's, yeah it was a stunt absolutely yeah. but it was a stunt that gets to the fundamentals of of activating on the back of, of, of your deals basically mm-hmm. um, yeah I think it's really interesting well the vast um, the vast difference between Premier League sponsorship and, and Championship sponsorship is, is huge you can sponsor four five Championship clubs for less than you can for one mm-hmm. Premier League club. So one of our clients in the past, I think, sponsored literally four or five yeah. championship clubs, in, but they were the biggest clubs in the championship, yeah, so yeah. they had massive reach. There were clubs, um, you know, Leeds getting 40,000 a week, uh, Borough getting 35,000 a week, Villa getting 42,000 a week, but then also their social presence. Villa still got two million Instagram followers. Yeah, um, it was not too far behind, well, probably more than... 11, 12 Premier League clubs. So actually by activating in, in various different areas, it's almost like micro-target, micro-targeting as well um, and doing it in the right way and obviously creating that content, engaging with the audience in, in, in the correct way. I know we've kind of focused on football a lot and that we're always going to kind of go there um, because we're three big football fans, but there are obviously other areas you know, in, in sport that sponsorship plays a big part. Um, I just keep thinking about back to times where clients have come to us and said, Oh, by the way, we sponsor a rugby club or we sponsor a cricket team um, or we sponsor England cricket team and 
we've got access to four players next week. Can you come up with an idea? And you're just like, why didn't you tell us six months ago? And actually, as you rightly say, that could be part of the full strategy. I think we've got to be, the, the big education part of this is moving away from that model, isn't it? 100%, yeah. So, yeah, the idea that we've got sponsorship, that's what we're going to do with it. If, if you're asking those questions, it's, it's already gone wrong, mm-hmm. basically. The sponsorship needs to be thought out from the very top in terms of who we're sponsoring, why we're sponsoring them, do they align with our values? Mm-hmm. And then the activation becomes far more organic, it becomes far more um, far more effective, frankly, because there is that link and there's that tie there. Now, we've obviously talked about big clubs, we've obviously talked about, as I mentioned, a lot about football. But in reality, that's just because that's the path of least resistance for people with big wallets you know Mm -hmm. that's just the most eyeballs in reality there's probably more effective sponsorships they could do with smaller or lesser known either sports or or games whether it's esports or whether it's um you know whether it's lower league whatever it may be there's almost certainly an element of right what does this do to align with our brand Mm -hmm. that we can then almost symbiotically um use to to bolster our, our sponsorship presence i think thinking about it from from a point of view where a lot of brands people already know. You know, unless you are a brand that's struggling for awareness, that's when you might want to slap your name on a Premier League shirt. But mm-hmm. in the lower league clubs or with with lesser sports, they can be vicarious. Where oh, that brand's associated with that sport. Mm-hmm. It does a job of lifting the presence of both, and yeah. that's because that's been chosen because it aligns with values, not because it aligns with the most eyeballs. Mm-hmm. Um, and that can be far more powerful, I'd suggest. Um, yeah, because you've got the, you know you've got your big events. You had the Olympics last year. We obviously got the, the the women's Euros this year, and we've got the men's World Cup in football later on in the year. But it's not just about the big events anymore, is it? It's no. about kind of taking those almost micro events, if if you want. That's probably downgrading those you know big big events for the for the other sports. Um, but you know, taking those other events across different sports, and and as you rightly say, using it in the right way, and actually understanding who understanding and doing the research about the audience who follow those sports to ensure that the brand is aligned 100 percent. so i mean the the fundamentals of sports sponsorship are the same as marketing you need an audience you need you know there has to be an audience that you're trying to attract it Mm -hmm. can't just be a case of there is eyeballs there's there's got to be some sort of demographic that you're you're interested in you know maybe we're really strong with millennials but we're struggling with gen z Mm -hmm. don't then go and put your sponsors on something that appeals to to the millennial audience start mm-hmm. thinking about what else that looks like and obviously we're we're a bunch of people sat around talking about football but things like esports and things like um women's sport are, are grown so massively especially with different demographics that that's where the value is for your your target for your goal um so it's really important to consider that i think i mean i mentioned esports and obviously you mentioned the big events there has never been more opportunity to sponsor sports full stop whether that's actual placements within leagues and teams you know back in the day it would be there's a shirt sponsor now you've got a shirt sponsor a sleeve sponsor short sponsor short yeah, yeah. exactly Player i don't know yeah. Goal sponsor. yeah i think Corner esports sponsor. gives so much opportunity doesn't it to brands as well because you've got the nfts people can buy almost tops and shirts and all that kind of stuff and that market's really strong and i think brands can really push the boundaries in that that world and people are used to it as well 100 percent. i think almost if there's one thing to come back to is that to market sports is to market experiences and esports gives people the closest thing to that experience so everyone there's kids around that you know dream of being david beckham you dream of being lewis hamilton you dream of these things by sponsoring esports when there's these ties you can be lewis hamilton you can mm-hmm. you know you can play the same f1 esports game that the world champion plays you can be that person. Mm-hmm. You don't have the same, you know, barriers. So when it comes to experiences, that is it's super powerful because whilst whilst, you know, you might sit here and think or, or the general public might think that oh, this is just a small little thing that happened in lockdown. It's not, it's massive. Um I think as some from some Nielsen, um from recent Nielsen study. It, uh, for Gen Z consumers, um I think it went the Summer Olympics and then esports is the second most mm-hmm. um most recognised sport or second really? yeah. yeah so worldwide. every other demographic every other demographic yeah worldwide wow. supports now every other demographic was Summer Olympics World Cup in that mm-hmm. order mm. those are the two you know those are the two most um, I suppose recognised there was some fascinating sports. insights too wasn't there in that report which touched on the fact that actually 
the Gen Z are actually looking at two forms of content when we're watching football or they're watching a the sport, they're actually on an app too, they're doing social media, so they're, they're using multi-channels at any one point. Exactly, and I think that that's massively important. It's a really, it's a really good point you mentioned. So we talked about continuing behaviour because that's what it all boils down to. It's what we're trying to influence as marketers. That's what we're trying to get to the bottom of. And that is changing. So you mentioned there the sort of multi-screening that, that now exists. And it, yeah, it's, it's fascinating how men, like how frequently people are doing other things whilst watching sports. And I, I'm guilty of it myself. I hadn't thought about it until I read this study. But if I'm watching the game on TV, unless it's, you know, you know especially if it's not my team or whatever, I'm on my phone, I'm scrolling through Twitter, I'm checking scores mm-hmm. of other games, um, my, maybe I'm ordering some food for half time, whatever else it may be. These are these are behaviours that marketers can pick up on, especially from the activation point of view, if and from a gamification point of view. If if I'm seeing a company's logo on screen and then I can interact with something that makes it feel part of the experience on my second screen, then you've crossed over. You've gone from being the the billboard on the telly to you know generally well in front of consumers, and that's massively important. So, Deliveroo do this really well. They sponsor the England men's team and England women's team. Mm-hmm. Because they know that people are going to open some sort of food service app whilst they're watching the first half. Yeah, they know that that's a behaviour that exists. I think um, I, I'll check some percentages, but it's about ten, fifteen percent of people watching games say that they have done that. So they know there's wow. a market there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're just making sure that they're the name on the telly, so yeah. that you, you know, a associate and b take that action. Mm-hmm. So. Again, it takes it away from being just an awareness thing to actually there's a really tangible conversion element to it there. There's a really tangible output. Of, that they can measure. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. They can say, right, during during the England game of the week, or on Tuesday, we saw 30% more orders than a typical Tuesday. Mm-hmm. And, and they'll have that data now, and that's another element of where marketing's going. Mm-hmm. If you have your objectives aligned to outputs, you can measure them effectively, and you can do these tests and you can do these isolations and and you can make sure that you've got these things against them rather than just relying on how many people watch that game and saw our shirt it's developing in a way that these things are far more easily understood whether it is the bottom funnel stuff or even the development of the top funnel stuff so you mentioned f1 before they have essentially an ai um essentially like an ai tool available to the people that sponsor the, the the championship and what that does is essentially shows you how much airtime your logo got throughout the TV stream really so obviously around the track you've got Rolex banners you've got mm-hmm. crypto.com banners but mm-hmm. you know there's you've got you've got sponsors on the gloves you've got all sorts the this AI basically watches the feed and then shows you and exposes just your logo throughout mm-hmm. the thing and then tells you okay for this stream you had this much airtime this much uh, yada, yada yada so you can start assigning value to the amount of time that you were on the screen versus the amount of people that are watching it, rather than just saying, oh, we were on the telly because yeah. we had a billboard yeah. and eight million people saw it. Mm-hmm. No, not necessarily. Mm-hmm. They made, you know, it was invisible. But by doing this, they can essentially figure out where the best placements are on track so that people are getting value, sponsors are getting value for money. It justifies their investment in a way that maybe previously wasn't possible. And it allows them to start assigning you know, uplift metrics and, and purchasing and metrics to their sponsorship of these championships and that's so powerful and so tangible that it really does you know for sports marketing to go beyond the name on a shirt it needs this data behind it Mm -hmm. marketers now obviously have access to so much information in terms of cost cpms cost per clicks cost per acquisition whatever it may be you can get that from another channel sports wasn't that way for a long time but it's slowly becoming that especially in the big leagues Mm -hmm. Um, and that'll only trickle down that you know, you'll only that that technology will only start being applicable to um, lower league stuff and whatever else it may be. That all of it becomes more valuable. It's the rising tide lifts all boats sort of thing. That you know, by by these brands having the cutting edge stuff at the very top, it trickles down to be more applicable to all brands. Mm-hmm. And what that'll do is just make sponsorship costs increase and make them more valuable. So it's a case of almost getting and maximizing now, whilst whilst you know there's still a little bit of reticence yeah, exactly, around it. Yeah. So yeah, it's really important to to I suppose make sure that you know a the strategy is lined up from the start. We're not just putting a name or something because someone in the marketing suite wants to. Mm-hmm. Why? Like, why does that align fundamentally? And then b how we're going to measure it? Do you think um, Do you think we'll ever go back to pre-COVID? You know, 
you talked about the change in the industry after after COVID had happened and the pandemic and how COVID brought that on. Do you think we'll go back to how things used to be or do you think that's changed and gone forever? I think it still happens, frankly. It's just now more obvious. So, I mean, I could ask you guys, you know, the spot, we, all, we all watched the Euros a couple of years ago. Can you name me any of the official sponsors? You could probably name me one or two. But yeah, it's, it's your classics, isn't it? It's Hisense, Coke, um, McDonald's. Well, you say the classics, um, Hisense, so they've not been in the game that long. Like, yeah. So they, so they are but you've got to remember that I'm a weirdo when it comes to football. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and we all work in marketing. <laughs> so, yeah, of course, we're not exactly the, uh, not exactly the demo. But I think Wanda, Heineken. Wanda I think was one. Wanda, yeah. Uh, Again, nice. like, they've paid an awful lot of money to be the you know one of the official partners of what the is Euros. It? What is Wanda? So hotel property group, I think. Right, OK. I believe, I think luxury hotels. Right, OK. We obviously aren't staying in them. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Get Get travel lunch. Yeah, pretty uh, weird, aren't they? No, I know about it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I think, I mean, there you go. If you want to reach out, uh, Premier and Travel Lodge. <laughs> um, no, the, the point there being that they've essentially done the old school approach from, what, from my point of view. They're not necessarily trying to attract me, so I may just not have seen it. I've I've mm-hmm. looked around for stuff, but I can't see any immediate tie-ins with mm-hmm. with the top level portfolio of. Uh, you know, I'm pretty sure they've got sub brands, but it doesn't make any sense to me that that is where they would spend their money mm-hmm. for yeah. that. Because again, we're all marketers, we're all football fans. We all watched probably not just the England games, but probably about eighty percent of the other matches. And you've been exposed to that logo for hours yeah. at this point. And if you can't conjure it up or, mm-hmm. or pull it out, then there's something gone wrong in the middle. Yeah, exactly. So, I suppose to answer your question, John, that pre-COVID marketing still happens. It's just more obvious, certainly to I think us in, in this room, because because it almost it's, it's just it's just forgettable. It's boring. There's no there's n- there's no clear direction for it, and 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 yeah, it still happens. Basically, we just need to make sure that you know we're we're more. We're armed with more information than ever when it comes to sports. We're armed with more means of activating it before. You've got better access. There's better tools to plan. That sports sponsorship isn't just ending there, that it goes much further into mm-hmm. that activation element. And that's where people let themselves down. It is the activation part of it. Where um, where are the where are they consuming the content then? Obviously there's there's various different channels they could be. And we know T V we've we've mentioned that quite a few times. What other kind of channels are th- is are the audience consuming the content? So again, from from that recent Nielsen study, the the typical big players, if you will, the the Facebooks and YouTubes, they have both essentially decreased in the amount of attention they capture when it comes to sports content, and and the big risers are Twitch and TikTok. Right. So that's short form video, mm-hmm. fundamentally on one side. So it's short content, you know, trendy, whatever it may be. That channel works if you understand that channel, mm-hmm. rather than it being. All right, we'll produce better content, yeah. and then we'll just cut it in a in a, a, a nine sixteen, yeah, in nine sixteen yeah, aspect yeah. ratio, mm-hmm. and it'll do well. No, it won't. You have to you have to consider that channel as its own thing. Short mm-hmm. form content is its own thing, mm-hmm. um, and then Twitch, which is the exact other side, which is athlete exposure. It's you know the more personable side. It's about the um, it's about the psychology of it. Basically, it's the fact that I can sit and watch Lando Norris, who's racing there at Silverstone or whatever in two weeks time in the mm-hmm. weekend but he's just playing the esports game in his room and talking to fans and, yeah. and that's the personal access that you essentially get mm-hmm. I think Sergio Aguero since retiring spends half his time on Switch doesn't he yeah. so yeah. These, this access is to athletes is, is so I think fascinating for the consumer because they've never had it before before you get either what's in an advert what's in an interview at the end of the game and that's basically it. Now you've got, you know, these athletes again have their personalities. They have Twitch streams. They have these things that bolster their own personal brand. But with that comes the opportunity to tie into it and associate with it. So they're two very opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of what's growing. If you were to summarise to a brand who was looking at entering into the sports sponsorship marketplace, where do you think they should start? I think, again, that's that's a question that you can't summarise in one sentence, and I do apologise for that because I'm sure you'd like the one sound about it, but I think fundamentally it has to be, it has to answer a number of questions. The first one is why. Why are you sponsoring something? What is, you know, why is that the thing that you're sponsoring, whether it's a team, whether it's a tournament, whether it's some, whatever it may be, why? Does it align with your brand? Is it an audience that you want to acquire? You know, what's the purpose of it, basically? 
Second is what are we trying to measure? What's the business objective for doing this? Um, you know, instead of it just being sort of brand awareness back in the day, sponsorships are now driving purchase intent, they're driving ROI, they're driving you know no, new audience acquisition, and these are all things that are, are massively important as part of the sponsorship package. You know, again, if you get the why right, that that bit comes a little bit more easily. And then the third part is is almost the the how we're going to measure what we do. So, you know, whether it's just single channel, you're probably doing the wrong thing, frankly. But mm-hmm. even still, how are we going to measure that um, in terms of success? Realistically, you need to be activating across multiple channels. Um, so digital is obviously the big one because you have the capability and the insight to target the same fan base with similar messaging and and whatever else it may be. So how are we measuring that? We've got the objectives, and this is this, it's amazing to me sort of being in the industry that this is where it typically falls down because people go, oh, we want more sales. But then they go, how are you measuring it? And they go, don't know. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, it's that the, it's almost like a break in, in in how we isolate the effects of sports sponsorship there. Mm-hmm. But fundamentally, if we can get down the the measurement, um, whether it is um, whether it is pure sales, whether it is new audience acquisition, whether it is um, increased market um, market share, whatever it, it may be, how do we measure it? And, and let's have a plan of that at the time instead of just we've done as you know we sponsorship we've sponsored something. And what what's happened on the back of it? What what's improved? If you have clear objectives going into it, then you can produce going backwards. Basically, you can use the activation in parallel with the creation. I think where sponsorship goes wrong is one outweighs the other. People mm-hmm. are sponsored because they've got an creative idea, they've got no idea how to activate it, mm-hmm. or yeah. they've got an idea that we want to activate and reach this audience, but they don't know how to produce the creative. Yeah, the, the execution's not good enough. Yeah, exactly. It's it's about making sure that. You know, this isn't the sponsorship is essentially irrelevant. It's a marketing, it's a vehicle. Mm-hmm. It's a, it's a, it's something that you springboard off. It's something that you leverage rather than it being its own thing. Sports sponsorship is at the centre of a much wider marketing strategy. Mm-hmm. Ineffective sports sponsorships, as far as I'm concerned. So, it's making sure that you don't just focus on the bullseye of this, mm-hmm. of this, which is just the logo on the shirt, and instead think about, okay. Here's the creative execution we can do because we want to reach this audience on this platform. There's your sentence. You said you couldn't do it in a sentence. <laughs> you just, you, I did say well, that. Well, it was probably about eight paragraphs, but at the end, you finally get to one <laughs> sentence. You talk your way around it, which is good. Now, yeah. Isaac, thank you very much for coming on, mate. It was really, really insightful. And obviously, we obviously could talk about this for hours, but we can't. Um, so, yeah, we'll, to, we'll, leave it, we'll leave it there. Thank you. Do you want to kind of tell people where they can find you? Um, not your house. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say your house in the pub. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I'm just honestly LinkedIn. Isaac Kirk, digital mm-hmm. strategist, Trunk BBI. Um, Good yeah, stuff. Hit me up. Nice one, Isaac. Cool. John. Thanks, Isaac. Yeah, it was brilliant. Thanks a lot. Learned a lot there. So sorry, I meant um, John. Do you want to tell people where they can find you? <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> you can find me in the pub. No, joking, joking aside, uh, you can find me as well on LinkedIn. It's John Butler, Trunk BBI CEO. Good stuff. You can find myself on LinkedIn, Adam Britton, and also if you want to see pictures of me um, doing things, because that's what Instagram is, <laughs> usually eating food and, and drinking. I don't know why you would want to do that. You can see, find me on Instagram, uh, Insta by Adam. You can also find us, um, Trunk BBI, on Instagram and also trunkbbi.com. Join us next time where we'll be joined by Emma Louise Jones, sports presenter, who will be going into all of her experience with the England men's team, um, rugby league, as well as the triathlon, and her opinion into the future of what it looks like when you've got talent and how you can make the most out of them whilst on set, and also how you can execute that through creative and activation. <laughs>